Right, welcome to another LinkedIn Live session with myself, Wasim, and of course my co-host today, Fahim. Uh, I'm just going to make sure that, as always, everything's all up to scratch and we're actually live. It seems we should be. Uh, yeah, that seems to be there, and we're live there as well, which means I should be able to see the comments very slowly. One second. Hello, everyone. Pleasure to be here today. Really excited, and hopefully, you know, we're going to have some great conversations. It's going to be a wonderful opportunity and evening for everyone to really, you know, share their ideas and really start to see the, you know, the opportunities that we do have. And, uh, you know, it's it's not just about owning a bricks and mortar pharmacy. There's a lot more to it. And uh, I think going on from that, uh, so we've been, um, we just want to let, Jane, know that she's there now, so it's all good. Yeah. Um, uh, the, the other thing is um, just letting um, people know, we often talk about, you know, what steps can we take next uh, in terms of progressing our careers or our business opportunities. I think I'm really looking forward to this session specifically because, uh, you know, a lot of healthcare professionals work really hard in their specific professions um, you know there's always of course an opportunity to progress in the career but a lot of them also do think you know what is it that I could be doing uh, you know in terms of setting up my own business or having a uh, you know a, a place where maybe I could collaborate with somebody and these are some of the questions we're going to be answering and hopefully uh, talking about today uh, and, and get these across to you. Yeah. And, uh, you know, one of the reasons why I was very much focused on setting up this particular evening was because there seems to be this objection where a lot of pharmacists have have uh, said that, uh, you know, you, Fahim, you own a pharmacy business, you have a pharmacy. So all the services, all the training, what benefit is it for me if I don't own a pharmacy business? You know, you talk about upskilling, you talk about developing clinical services, but I don't own a pharmacy. So what benefit will I have by, you know, developing my clinical skills or, you know, looking to kind of train myself and so forth? And the other thing was to really, you know, it's going to be great to have a, what I say, like a multidisciplinary approach here where we've got multiple professions working together. And I just think that's uh that's exactly what the you know what the NHS needs, and it's fantastic for for patient healthcare and moving this uh, you know moving this this forward. I think also importantly, um, whereas before, if you thought about setting up a business, you were thinking you could buy bricks and mortar, or you need a physical space. We know now with the advent of uh, the internet, and you look at companies like Amazon, you look at companies uh, like uh, Facebook, and uh, you look at the uh, Twitter and all these things, it's completely changed the way, you know, we do business today. So what does that mean for us? It means, well, you can get your word out much easier. You can set up platforms which don't necessarily have a physical space, but still really reach uh, your customers and uh, your clientele, your patients, uh, so that they get value. Uh, and, and, you know, th this is the thing. I think uh, people think, well, you know, if I, if I don't have the physical space, uh, you know, does it count? And not specifically in the other sectors, because you can see people uh, online influencers or people who've gone on and set up their online businesses, uh, you know, they've done it really well. But in the healthcare sector specifically, we have a lot of what I call barriers in, in mindset, which uh, we, we uh, struggle to go across, uh, you know, and, and I think this webinar and live session specifically for them, you know, if, you, if you're a nurse or you're a pharmacist or you're a doctor, it doesn't matter what it is uh, or what profession you're doing and you're good at what you do and you're passionate about it, then why can't you set up your own service which reaches out to your customers or, you know, kind of uh, collaborate with somebody else? Yeah, and we, today, we you know, we've got a Literally exactly that. We have pharmacists, we have nurses, we have doctors, and they're really going to be sharing their journey. And, you know, it's not all about the bricks and mortar approach and, uh, you know, taking taking things from there. And also, most importantly, um, you know, what steps they took, uh, how do they get past those barriers of, uh, you know, I'm going to set up my own space, whether they set up their own training company or whether they uh, decided to uh, set up their own uh, practice online. So, you know, these are some of the things hopefully we're going to be sharing with you. And I'm, I'm hoping, you know, you, you really do uh, gain from that. So 
uh, without much further ado, I'm going to uh, hopefully be uh, getting on Mr. Tawheed uh, Islam and uh, inviting him onto the stream. So, uh, Tawheed, great to have you here. Good evening. Thank you so much for joining us on this stream. Now, tell us a bit about yourself and your career. Um, I started being well, I've qualified in 2005. I've uh, been a locum ever since then, did some stints as a manager uh, for a couple of companies. Uh, but around 2016, um, when low coming was literally going downhill, um, I started going online, looking at social media posts, looking at what the situation is and why low coming is going down. Um, and I looked and I saw the the problems that we were facing as a profession. So I started. I opened up one small group to support locums in a in just in Manchester, Northwest area. And that really grew rapidly within a few days. The group was full. And then we went on to make a big and big group. And we found that the more we talked to pharmacists across the board, the more we found that there was um, a real need for unity within the uh, profession, but especially within the locum community. <clears throat> and that led me to obviously start the whole pharmacy cooperative with a group of other pharmacists uh, who shared the same vision. Um, and we knew it wasn't going to be easy. But we had the technology on our side. We started using Telegram, which at that time no one knew how to use. No one really heard of it. And from there, we had uh, one of the fastest growing uh, groups for pharmacists. And then we established the Pharmacist Cooperative as a support organization for pharmacists. Um, and that, over the years, has grown rapidly. Now we have almost well, well, 10,000 pharmacists we have on the network. That's amazing. And that really is growing rapidly, and that has helped a lot of people, um, A, to network, and B, to really see the situation on the ground. A lot of times we'd rely on our friends, for, uh, and we'd talk about what's going on. You know, it's, it's within a very small circle of friends that we would know this is the position on the ground, but now you can talk to anyone from Scotland to down in Somerset and find out what's the situation on the ground is welcoming really bad? Uh, are you guys providing certain services? Do you need clinical support? You have a group of about three and a half to 4,000 pharmacists who can instantly help answer any kind of questions. So it's really helped the profession itself come together. And I've been speaking to a lot of um, companies um, over the years as well. And even the other, yesterday, I was speaking to one uh, locum agency from Ireland and they just said, look, you've done an amazing job of bringing locums together, something that has never happened before. Um, and you know, if local agencies and companies are noticing it, then you can understand the power that this network has in bringing people together. And a lot of locums have over the over the last few months, years, have said how it has changed their perception of pharmacy. A lot of them have now want to stay within the profession because they have the support network there, which they previously didn't have. I um, mean, we have our professional body, but again, it's not that doesn't provide that level of service uh, that you need on a day-to-day -day basis. You can't just send a quick message and get a response. And I think that's what really helped with the whole cooperative. But as a pharmacist, I, I think there's a lot that you can do. Um, I know a lot of people ask, you know, what else can I do? And the cooperative is there to support you on a professional level, but we also have our uh, Project Unicorn, which is a um, basically a small group I set up to support uh, tech startups within the uh, pharmacy sector. So any pharmacist that was size on his or her own tech company can join the group, ask for support, and we have a massive network, both national and international uh, network that we can tap into through our head office in, at the landing. And that, again, that's another la layer of support that we give to uh, to the network and to our own members as well. Totally. So I mean, th there is, um, I mean, that's just one of the things that I've, I've done. And um, around the same time I started the cooperative, I was looking at, because I was really tired of pharmacy myself and I wanted to try something different. Um, and I started a couple of uh, things. One of the projects I started was a, um, a pre training company um, and also a uh, health tech company as well. So to tell um, me, you know, to, to do what you're doing, right? Uh, and I want to talk about your mindset here. Obviously, previously, you, you qualified as pharmacist, you were welcoming. What was... 
the mindset that was first of all for example you you said okay you know Logan was it going so well and that's what made you feel that you had to do something different but what was the mindset what was the barrier of you not doing that early in your career first earlier in the career things were good and when things are good you don't tend to look elsewhere to see what else the other people are whilst the rest, everyone else is going through for me i was always on really good rates oh, sorry my camera can be short right. So that's the thing with tech. There's Can you see me now? Uh, <laughs> uh, hi, sir. <laughs> we're back on, yeah. um, we're back on now. Uh, yes, I mean, earlier in the career, um, I didn't have any issues with getting work. or um, you know, I was always on good rates uh, as a locum. But when things went down, uh, downhill, I'm, my salary literally just halved within a year or two. Um, thing, then I started looking at, well, something's yeah, gone wrong. What was the salary at that time? Uh, at the peak, you know, I, I was on around 80 to 90 thousand a year as a locum. Wow. Which was, you know, which is comfortable. And I didn't have to really haggle as hard as I do these days. And I, as a lot of locums do these days. But like within a space of a couple of years, that literally went down to 40, 45 thousand. Um, and, you know, when it goes down that fast, you know, there's something wrong within the market itself. Now, as a locum, we are businesses ourselves. So when, you know, when people say, you know, you're just a pharmacist, no, we're not. We have a specific set of skills and that's our business. We go through five years of training to hone our skills, to improve our knowledge. And we have an information asymmetry over other uh, professions. Doctors, yes, they study pharmacology, but not to the depth that we do. So that skill is important. It's so important that without us, a pharmacy can't open. So you, I, I spoke with you briefly uh, a week or so ago, and you, you, you spoke about this transition period where none of the major organisations were willing to take you on as a locum because you were, you know, you were stepping out of, you know, you were saying things that maybe some people did not like, or you were telling things how they were. How did you deal with that? How did you deal with actually being? You know, frankly, not getting offers from Booth, not getting offers from Lloyd's. How did you deal with that kind of mental stress of not being able to locum for any of those big companies? It was stressful. It wasn't easy. And um, when I set the whole thing up, I knew I was going to get a lot of flack. And because when you can't just go up to the biggest players in the market and say, you know what, I'm not going to take what you give me because I know I'm worth more. At that time, the locum numbers were, the pharmacist numbers were steadily increasing. So there was um, a large oversupply of pharmacists. There still is right now. Uh, but the point is, uh, the problem is we had the companies and we had the agencies working together to ensure the pharmacist salaries were kept low, the, the locum rates were kept low. Uh, and I had threats from a certain agencies as well that I need to stop, you know, telling locums not to use agencies and to go direct and it makes them look bad and they're not happy with the way things are. So I said, look, ultimately we're a business, we're using your services. Absolutely. If you're not giving us what we need, we'll go somewhere else. And I know the value of my uh, skills and as a pharmacist and as a locum, if Lloyd's and if Boots wasn't willing to give me work, then I'll go somewhere else. So luckily I always had at least some work. And the good thing about being a locum is you don't need to work if you get uh, if you can negotiate well. You don't need to work seven days a week. You don't need to live on hundred thousand pound a year. You could easily live on thirty, forty thousand a year, and then in that time, use a spare time to think what else can you do with your time. If yeah. I am intelligent enough to get a master's in pharmacy, then I'm obviously intelligent enough to do something else. So in that time, I looked at all the other things. Obviously, I, I set up the farms cooperative to support uh, and bring the farms together. Um, share the knowledge that we have, teach people how to negotiate, teach them what their value is, and then see how things go from there. And, you know, it worked really well. A lot of farms started coming back and saying, you know what, it's worked well for us. You mentioned um, something but obviously really at that time, I wasn't getting much work. You mentioned something really important there, of which I like, because I think what you realised was that it's, it's not a case of, you know, just stopping everything you're doing. So you continued locoming but you manage your time appropriately yeah. until the time wasn't right. You don't do, you know, you don't just shut everything and disappear. I think that's a read, no, I think I'm there's a lot you said about that, of the way you, you know, you you kept going, because you've got to keep the lights on, right? You can't just decide yeah. to say, okay, all of a sudden, 
I'm just going to invest all my, you know, put my eggs in one basket. So then what was your scariest, or not even scariest, but when you when you took this journey and decided, okay, I'm going to do something out of the box, uh, what were the fears? What were, what was the things that you thought, oh, what if this goes wrong? You know, what, what talk to talk well, me about the, the biggest fear was that the fact that if this goes wrong, I literally won't be getting any work as a local pharmacist. <laughs> now, I, <laughs> that was simply not, <laughs> no light. So, and at that time, uh, my wife was a, was a uh, dental student. Uh, I had two kids. I had a couple of mortgages uh, because earlier on when things were good, I invested in properties. So I had about a good few mortgages going out as well. And I was like, things go wrong. I am screwed. Um, like, to be honest, the way I saw it, you know what? This is gonna. This is either gonna make me or break me. Yeah, I have to do this because I know the power of social network. I've seen. I grew up with Facebook and all the other social networks, and I've seen how that changed people. And I've seen within a within a very short amount of time how fast our groups just on WhatsApp grew. We had three groups, and that literally filled up within a week or so. Um, and I was still I was starting to get feedback from pharmacies saying, you know, this has worked really well. Your advice of negotiating and holding out um, and uh, and not listening to agencies has helped a lot. And it literally, some locums went from working at 17, 18 pound an hour to working at 30, 35 pounds an hour and not accepting any less. I had a locum the other day who said, you know, she's just qualified last year and now she's on eight, she's already at 80,000 plus and she's still got two months off. So I was hearing this kind of stories earlier on. So I knew that this is going to work, but I'm going to have to take that really big risk where it's going to either, like I said, make me or break me. But at the same time, I didn't, I like to spread my um, eggs out in different baskets. So I was, I sat up, uh, well, I worked with a good friend who was running a pre training company and he took me on and he said, look, partner with me. You see, you, you understand pharmacy really well. Um, I've got this company that's going, going really well. Work with me. I said, yeah, let's do this. So we were starting together, took a bit of time to get that going, but it, you know, it, w- it went well. Um, then I started a uh, health tech company as well, which I'm still working on, but I think that's a story in itself because when we started that one, it was like we were looking at a really blue sky idea first where we were looking at using VR to um, support the... Um, Sorry, I've got someone at the door. Uh, we're looking at using VR and EEG to support uh, psychotherapy. So the plan was that the uh, your VR headset would look at your brainwave patterns and um, use that as a way to uh, improve therapy. Uh, so we, t- we went to NHS with the idea, and the NHS said, the guys at NHS said, oh, great, that's a great idea. You've done your research, yes. Uh, are you, do you, know, do you know any, do you know how to develop hardware? No. Do you know how to code? No. Are you a psychologist? <laughs> no. So what are you then? Pharmacist. It's okay. You know, one uh, of the I, I actually put out there was to say pharmacists will make excellent tech partners. Uh, and I mean, yeah. whether that's e-learning platforms or whether that's but just because of the kind of skill base. And, and in fact, you've, you've proved to be one of the, uh, you know, uh, examples, I guess, uh, who's who's vented out in that. Um, so to tie this up, uh, just mm-hmm. because of the time, three things you would advise any healthcare professional who's thinking, okay, I'm a nurse, I'm a pharmacist, I'm a doctor, or you know, whatever, I'm a paramedic. Can I go in the tech industry, or can I even venture out of my current profession, or can I still do what I love, but still kind of explore the opportunities? Because obviously, you did. Okay, so let me finish, tell you the other half of the story. Sure. Yeah, and I think that will explain uh, your answer as well. Sure. So when he said, you know, well, as a pharmacist, what else can you do? So I said, well, off the literally just off the machine, I said, look, um, as pharmacists, obviously we have experts in, um, in pharmacology and medicine. So the prescribing support software needs to be updated. So we can develop something on that side where the software doesn't just look at the BNF and Stockley's. It looks at the patient's age, gender, uh, liver function, kidney function, genomics, and using that, it will give you a much more accurate, personalized feedback on what you need to do, uh, what the, the needs to be prescribed. Um, and so, yeah, that's a brilliant idea. Go away and do it. it. Took us about a year and a half. And it was probably one of the toughest um, things that I've ever done. But 
we're starting with absolutely nothing, no funding. Uh, we managed to get some of the leading uh, experts in genomics in the country uh, on board. We've got one of the uh, best on experts in the country on um, intelligent systems. So we're going to we're gonna have to get Jane on now. Uh, okay, cool. Wrap it up. Three so, things. Okay, wrap it up to in 10 seconds is that, yes, you can. Um, if your idea is good, do the research and just keep at it. You can do pretty much anything you want, uh, but it has to bring value. And that's the most important thing. Thank you. So, thank you for that. I think, and I've got cough again. Okay. No, no, especially about the tech journey. I think that that was uh, very powerful, and um, uh, we'll have to have a further discussion on that, especially that specific point. But uh, thank you so much for joining the stream. Thank you. Thanks for having me. All right, buddy. Uh, so that was Toidul. Uh, interesting story, uh, especially about. I'm a big tech. Um, uh, you know, it, it really fascinates me how other professionals can join this career. Uh, and regardless of not having any background in coding and some of the things that we don't mention. So I think that was absolutely powerful. And, uh, you know, if you want to know more about how he did it, do get in touch with him. I'm going to now bring Jane Lambert onto the stream. Uh, Jane, welcome. Hi, thank you. Jane, it's, uh, it's a wonderful touch to have you here. And, uh, you know, as a, you know, I, I've always said this, but I have huge respect for the nursing profession everything that nurses have done from you know, getting the non-medical prescribing to control innovation, the whole thing. And, you know, this just fits nicely. So, you know, where, where does Jane kind of come into to pharmacy? You're a nurse. How did this happen? How did it happen? So I think, I think my passion for um, training, well, certainly from um, being a nurse in the first place, my passion very quickly grew into um, emergency medicine and training, really, and actually recognising that, the quality of training to actually be, be able to deliver good expert um, patient care was really essential. So I think I set up at Mitchell Keynes Hospital, the resuscitation training department, um, did that really well, really happy with it. And I think um, I ended up having a long extended break abroad, which time out to reflect actually came back and thought, I can do this for myself, good business model, I can do it for myself, initially set up training other nurses and doctors, which we still do. Um, but actually, I got approached by a pharma company quite early on in the days of ECG, and they asked if we could pull together a training programme for pharmacists because they were considering pharmacists vaccinating. That shows you how long ago that was. So um, in the very early days, we pulled together. And, yeah, absolutely. We've got the skills. I've got all of the skills there. How do we put that together to train pharmacists? And that was really our first introduction um, to pharmacy, in fact, straight into um, Boots and Lloyds. Wonderful. So so you so you start off by actually educating uh, nurses and doctors when you move into pharmacy. What's it been like from pharmacists then to where they are now? How have things changed? Well, massively. I mean, if I think back to the day where, you know, I would stand up and teach um, a room full of pharmacists to vaccinate in the very early days when it was new for everyone and seeing kind of the horror and scare on everyone's faces and I really got to put a needle into somebody to now where it's bread and butter, you know, you qualify all the expected flu vaccinations without a second thought. Um, you know, some pharmacists are now moving on to obviously travel health and even, you know, injecting children and, and even some now to um, infants and babies. So it's been really lovely to see the journey and I guess, A, the confidence in the profession, but I think also the confidence in the general public. So I think, um, again, probably in those early days, you know, the general public wouldn't expect to go into a local pharmacy and have an injection or have a vaccine. Whereas I think now there's that common expectation. So I think... I think, you know, you're well placed, you've got good, trusted community around you. Um, and yeah, things have significantly changed. And, you know, I think the future is exciting of where it can go as well. Wonderful. So, you know, we, we spoke about the, the opportunities that pharmacists have and, you know, the need to focus on giving value to, to your people. And you know, we talk about vaccinations, tra travel vaccinations. You know, we've, we've benefited ourselves you know, from, yeah. from 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 uh, a particular company you make mention of, and uh, and and you know, have been extremely well. 
what about this? Uh, how do you think this change with the, with the contract slightly changing now and vaccinations going back into practice? Do you feel that's going to have, have an effect on this investment in travel vaccinations? How should, what advice would you give pharmacists from that? I, I think I would still go full steam ahead. I think patients and the general public are have got a lot of confidence in community pharmacy. And I think you know, bigger than anything is the convenience. You know, they trust their pharmacists; they're accessible. Um, and, and I think the, the big way forward, I think, from a pharmacist's point of view, is if or, or when you feel confident enough to be able to expand your travel health to include the whole family. And, and I appreciate some pharmacists now still feel hesitant about potentially including babies. And I completely get that, completely get that. But I think it's about offering, you know, continuing down the stream of accessible healthcare. And if you're, you know, vaccinating three quarters of the family, then that's not wholly accessible. So it's about gaining that confidence however you can really to expand that. But again, I think a lot of people will, um, will still continue to want to pay for that. A pharmacy without doubt. Jade, I'm, I'm going to uh, touch upon the same kind of thing, uh, which I asked from Hidal, which was mindset. You know, whenever someone takes, like you've been in there, uh, you're a qualified practitioner, you know, what were the barriers for you doing what you do now? You know, what kind of made you want to do uh, the ECG training? And, you know, and, and what were the fears about setting it up and why you were trying to set it up and how did you kind of overcome those? Okay, so I think certainly mindset, I think um, I still consider myself a nurse and not a businesswoman slash saleswoman. I think sales are absolutely not for me. And I guess people always think if you're running a business, you've got to be into sales to sell it. I personally think that people buy from people. I think if you're passionate about what you do, you don't really have to sell because people will, you know, if you've got, if you're adding value and you're passionate about it, people will believe in you. I think people will want to work with you. And um, so certainly that was, you know, I was without a doubt passionate and still am from the day I started 18 years ago. Um, and I think that makes a big, big difference. Um, and I guess if some people now are in pharmacy disillusioned, how do you fall in love with it again? I don't know, but I think it's about finding a way to fall in love with it again. Or, or <laughs> part of it you can fall in love with again, I suppose. Um, I guess one of the fears for me was um, having no money. <laughs> so, you know, I remember that um, I left my job at the hospital. I was single at the time with no children. So that was a bit easier on the sort of dependence point of view. But I rented a couple of rooms out. I'm also a qualified acupuncturist. I don't know, it always seems to be about the needles. Um, so I found some private acupuncture clinics. So just to keep, you know, just to keep going, my head over water. And I remember, you know, my first day opening a paper diary at that point, and it was blank. And I just remember looking at it there thinking, how am I going to fill all these pages with training, with work, with income? Um, but you did. And I did. Um, and I think it's about believing in yourself. And, you know, and I like the feeling of having no ceiling. With, you mentioned again that he didn't have a background in coding, he was not a tech person, but he went up and set up this business. Similarly, you've gone up and, and set up a platform. You know, what, how, was that, how hard was that for you? Again, um, I'm not sure if you do have any tech background, but uh, if you didn't, what, did that, did that, how am I going to do this? <laughs> Because, again, like I say, you know, as a nurse, I had no business skills as such, although I think a lot of skills that you develop in life um, are quite generalist skills. Um, but if I'm honest, at the beginning, I made up a lot. <laughs> so, you know, when I looked at products, you know, obviously I, I tested the market. A lot of it was probably intuitive for me. So I wasn't basing it on informed decisions necessary or, or you know, strategy, which I do now. Um, but at the time, it was just going with my gut feeling a lot, um, talking to people. And I think still now, that's what I do a lot of talking to people, finding out what they need and offering a solution. So, um, so yeah, and, and actually, I sometimes laugh and look at how, you know how the business has been so successful over the years. Um, and you know, two years ago, I did actually do a, a business growth program at a local university, and um, because I kind of thought, you know, maybe I'm still missing that business mind, even though the business is going really well. And actually, that that for me answered a lot of questions from the point of view that actually a lot of things I was doing, I was doing well, but obviously equally gave me added value as well. Perfect. Jane, three things or three pieces of advice that you'd give to those individuals who are in the profession and those who are within the profession. What three things would you say, looking at, thinking about policy, the future, would advise pharmacists? 
can you say that again? Sorry, you broke up. Three three pieces of advice that you'd give to those individuals who are either newly qualifying and coming into the profession. It could be any healthcare profession, whether you're a nurse, whether you're a doctor, whether you're a pharmacist, and those are already within the profession. What advice would you give them? Okay, so I think one would be um, don't stop learning. Keep, keep pushing yourself, keep challenging yourself. Um, don't become complacent. There's always more to know. Um, I think, secondly, don't forget little things. So, you know, don't ever get too big or too successful that you haven't got time for people. Whether that's time for colleagues, or that's time for encouragements, you know, those little things actually make a big difference in your day-to-day work, but also in, in business. Um, and I think the third thing would be the work-life balance. So whenever I think about my business goals and where I want to go in business, I, I have to, and I do, think about my personal goals. So, for example, I only work four days a week. So it's what you want out of life and does your business path match your personal path and align those two. Jane, why do you do what you do? Why? Because I love it and I'm passionate about it and I want to make a difference for patients. Bottom line is that, really. Jane, thank you so much for coming on. Um, we're probably going to have to do individual sessions with all of you. There's so much to share. But uh, thank you so much for coming on the screen. Thank you for having me. It's been a delight. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Uh, well, that was brilliant. Um, I really enjoyed that. And uh, most importantly, the why of why we're doing what we're doing and how, in the end of the day, a four day week is, is that's incredible. I think that's something we you know, can all achieve. So I'm going to bring on now Dr. Khalid. Uh, Dr. Khalid, welcome to the stream. Hi guys, hi. Thanks for having me here. No, oh, great. Um, so, Dr. Khalid, obviously we uh, briefly had a chat. We've still got to have a real big chat, but for him, I'll let you fire away with this one. Uh, Dr. Khalid, first of all, how do you go from optometry to medicine? What, what, what's that all about? How did that happen? So, uh, for him, I, I basically was a pretty happy optometrist uh, in the third you know in the in the pre-reg year but very quickly optometry became clear to me optometry was quite commercial and i worked for one of the big chains there's a lot of um similarities with the pharmacy setup and i realized that i feel like i'm not i felt to myself i wasn't a clinician and um i felt pressurized by sales targets i didn't feel that i was inspired in my team and I thought, I'm young enough to make a change. I wanted to help people more. Mm-hmm. I can do more. And I felt that really this wasn't this wasn't the career for me. So I applied to graduate entry medicine in my pre-reg year. And with the forcefulness of my father, who I thank greatly for pushing me to complete my pre-reg year, I got into med school the day that I actually finished my pre-reg. Wow. Wow. So... <coughs> How's it? So, what what are the differences in terms of the the learning uh, that you undertake as a doctor versus the learning that you'd undertake as an optometrist? You know, what how how's that different? So, it was quite a it, it was quite a long haul, and it was quite a big step for me. I mean, we started with the basics of biochemistry. We went into anatomy, then we did our clinical rotations where we do. The, you know, the medical, the surgical, the psychiatry, the obs and gynae. We had to deliver babies. We had to, um, you know, do elderly care, go to care homes. It was, it is completely different, whereas optometry just focused on the eye, you know. So you do your basic <laughs> sciences and you focus on the eye. And there I am being asked, you know, deliver a baby, examine this child. Um, and, it, you know, you do ethics and it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a real minefield medicine. And they really throw you in the deep end of these four-year courses. And, you know, we we know that there's this non-medical prescribing, whether it's a pharmacist, whether it's a nurse, whether it's a, uh, op, you know, op- optom. What advice would you give a pharmacist wanting to develop their clinical skills and, you know, and being safe at it? You know, as a doctor, what advice would you give? I think that's a great question. I mean, I, I see minor illness all the time as a GP registrar and I, I you know this is this is essentially what takes up a lot of GP practices time so I'm all for the non-medical prescribers and allied healthcare professionals like pharmacists who are experts in medicines helping us to treat patients effectively in terms of advice that I'd give um, I think we're in a society where litigation is more is more common and we have to be if we are taking on prescribing roles, we have to be sure that we 
have the knowledge behind it, which is why I think that what you guys are doing is great because you're teaching the anatomy from, you're, you're using a, a top-down approach. You go from the basics. You can't prescribe for conditions that you don't, when you don't understand anatomy, I don't think that that's possible. And I think that might lead to um, misdiagnosis. So if you start from the basics and work your way up, that's the best way to go. I think that if you have safety netting and good relationship with your GPs, they'll help you, they'll support you. And I think that um, if you are taught well and you work hard, that you can do anything, you know, and you can achieve anything. And there are, I can see pharmacists being partners in GP practices if, you know, if one day nurses are doing it. And I'm sure that, you know, one day most minor illnesses will be led by non, non-doctors. You, you know, Dr. Khalid, you personally had got in touch with me uh, l- last week and you, you had a particular question about, you know, the training that we're offering in the Marcy program and so forth. What were your concerns? What were you, what, what, what led you to, to kind of get in touch with me personally? And, and, and uh, after we had the discussion, how did you feel? So um, I, I uh, you know, I'm a big fan of social media and LinkedIn. And I uh, obviously saw your post on the use of new technologies to visualize the eardrum and the throat. And I thought, that's actually fantastic, you know, because I've learned, I was thinking I'm a doctor and I've seen this in a pharmacy, um, you know, so a social media page. And I was quite shocked um, that I've never, that's the first thing I'm, I, I wanted to sort of inquire about that. And then I said to you, for him, I know you're training pharmacists and uh, if you look at the ear, say, for example, there's a perforation or someone comes and you're looking at their throat and actually this patient comes with a cough and they've got a cancer. You know, so four weeks history of cough, generally we, we do investigate quite deeply. Um, and if so, well, my concern and my question to you was, how will you safety net these pharmacists? How will you safeguard them? Or how will they safeguard the patient to make sure that they are not missing a potential, you know, safety incident or issue which involves a cancer or some other sepsis or other very significant condition. Dr. Khaled, I'm just going so, to also add to that. Uh, so Mohsin Ashraf, one of the questions he's put is litigation is a huge issue. How do we NMPs try to avoid defensive medicine, which ties in with what you're saying. So, uh, you know, how, how do we avoid it? Okay, so I'll tell you what Fahim's answer was to me. He said, don't, you know, he said that we will be teaching specific core conditions and when we teach them, we will teach them well, okay? So that's the first thing. We gave examples. For example, um, you know, a rash. I've seen patients that have been prescribed um, certain creams for rashes that are not appropriate. Now, if you teach the person from the basics about the skin, the layer, they're more likely to understand what is eczema, what is psoriasis, what is scabies, you know? Because if you just show pictures and say, this is scabies, this is eczema, you're unlikely to understand how to diagnose and treat correctly. So what Fahim said to me is I'm teaching them from the beginning in separate specific conditions. And I know which conditions or which patient groups are not appropriate to be seen. So, for example, a child coming with a fever and a rash, probably not appropriate for a pharmacy to see. Very high risk uh, scenario. Uh, and even if the patient is seen, he said, I'll write a discharge summary. I'll follow the patient up. I'll have good communication with the GP. And then I said, actually, that's fantastic. If it's done the right way, then I think the patient is safe, the practitioner is safe, and the GP will be will 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 be helped by the history taking and the correct information being given, and the patient may have um, access to treatment quicker than they would otherwise do if they're waiting for someone like me. Brilliant. And finally, Dr. Khalid, three things uh, you would advise to healthcare professionals. You know, uh, as he's talked in the start, you know, not everybody owns their own uh, physical business. And and tr- truth be told, right now, I, I I don't feel you need to. So if, if you're a healthcare professional now and you're thinking, do I set up my own website? <laughs> do I set up my own private practice? Or, you know, can I join a tech startup? You know, what three things would you t- say to them? I'm looking at you know the roles that we employ and the roles that we have in GP practices and the kind of um, tech that doctors do and I think you know like your colleague uh, the nurse Jane said that you have to be innovative and offer a service that is very high quality. You have to work hard. You have to understand your field 
and put the work in, it takes a lot of time. Secondly, I would say safety netting, safety netting and safety netting again. That's the most important thing. Even if you misdiagnose um, something that is considered minor illness, if you've got the good documentation, you've explained your differential diagnosis, you've shown that you've told the patient what they should do if this, this, this doesn't happen, then you're, I think actually that is quite a safe way to practice. Um, I think that you can cover yourself and you can share the risk with the patient, you know, and say, that actually, it could be this, but I'm going to treat you for this. And if it doesn't work, go see your GP, you know? So I think if we've got a good systematic approach, then you guys um, can help and provide the NHS with very good care. Perfect. Thank you so right. much for coming on. That was uh, brilliant. And as I said, I, I just don't feel we've had it, had enough time, but it's great to get your stories and uh, it'll be great to do longer sessions with uh, all of you and uh, you. You know, have these discussions. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, we've had Dr. Khalid, we've had Jane, we've had Tohido. Now uh, I'm going to bring on Darren, um, who is, in fact, we were right here in where you see us now physically uh together and it's just been a couple of weeks so it's great to have him on board and uh darren is also a pharmacist darren great to have you on uh this linkedin live session hi uh, hi guys so darren obviously you're about to start your independent prescribing and of yeah course, literally the first session yesterday the mastery medlin program but before you got there first tell me what made you decide that okay I, i'm a pharmacist but now uh, you know, yes, I, I've been doing pharmacy, but I want to upskill and I want to start prescribing, considering that there's been a number of prescribers since the prescribing uh, regulations came out for non-medical prescribers, especially pharmacists who have not you know, done anything with that at all. So, you know, what made you take the step? <coughs> well, primarily uh, as a locum working sort of all, all over all over the country, really, you sort of see there's a big need for patients to actually see someone actually get treatment and not have to wait the couple of weeks for a GP appointment or the extended time to actually get care. Um, that coupled with hearing stories of uh, clinics and then sort of seeing the news of Fahim's success and all your success of what can be done with the uh, NMP uh, qualification and what pharmacists can do, um, it was just, it just made sense. It made sense to just jump in. And uh... So, so that was the point where, okay, you know, you made this thought, you've taken the step, uh, and and you know, what what are the kind of barriers that you foresee uh, potentially getting in your head? Because we all have this little voice in our heads that tells us, oh, but you know, yes, you're doing this. But do you really want to be doing this? This can go wrong. That go wrong. How do you deal with that? Well, I think it's as as you sort of asked the previous uh, interviewers, interviewees. Uh, it's about mindset, really. Um, it's sort of you've got to understand there are going to be hurdles there are going to be little thoughts and sort of people doubting you on the way but sort of getting that network getting mentors which is why sort of the medline program was something I wanted to join um, it's just having that network to be able to ask questions and this is like a proven business model um, this isn't now new where you, you guys sort of pave the way this is something that I could always refer back to and uh, grow into a better, better company and what else do you think like okay you're going to do your prescribing you've done your mastery program you're a prescriber what are your plans um you know so uh, and it's quite relevant in that okay you don't physically in a pharmacy <laughs> but how are you then going to use that practice not just to kind of you know demonstrate your skills and, and really get out there and advance your career but you know from your own financial perspective you know how do you foresee using this so that you can uh become more financially free Right. So for me, what this is all about is building that solid foundation. Mm -hmm. um, at the end of it, I, I don't expect to be uh, massively financially free, but it's a building that solid fa uh, foundation to be able to then grow into further venues. Um, it's sort of, well, my aim is to build a clinic and the, the minor ailment scheme um, will help with that. But being able to show peers uh, and other colleagues that this can be done will help me grow to a bigger business where you could venture to say dermatology, to um, aesthetics, you can venture into sports medicine um, and work with peers in podiatry, chiropractory. Uh, it's a big, big market out there, and it's all about getting that solid foundation. Now, Darren, I think it was, uh, you know, when I had a conversation with yourself before you joined on the program, it's just your drive. And I just think that you're, you know, we had a conversation 
And I, I just think that, you know, this is this is absolutely the right time. It's not about whether you're a locum. It's not about whether you are you have a business or don't have a business. The opportunity, see, you want to stay ahead of the curve. I've always said that it's, you know, you don't want to be, neither do you want to be behind the curve, neither do you want to be too far ahead of the curve. But you 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 got to be there and doing it before everyone's doing it. But there is a right way to do it. And, you know, we've had uh, Dr. Khalid talk about the need for education and training. We've had Jane mention and echo the same things. We've had Thoidul also mention the importance of mindset, staying focused, and basically stepping out of your comfort zone. Now, you yourself, you know, what, what kind of fears did you have? Because, you know, you're not a, you don't, you don't own a business, you, you, you're you low coming at the moment. What was your fears? What really, what was really nagging you at the back? You know, what were you, what was, what was, what's kind of prevented you from upskilling before? Well, what was preventing before was um, you go to these workshops and you see, you hear stories of you've done like a three day program and then you come out of it and you're not really confident and you're not really going to sort of really use that skill. Even sort of on the study days I've been to, you get all signed off and then you leave and you're wondering, well, I'm by myself now. Uh, can I really do this? And you have those doubts. You have those sort of almost imposter syndrome, sort of, yeah, you've got the learning and you've done everything, but when it comes to it, are you really capable of doing it? And that's the main thing, really. And just you get know, that part of a mentorship. I think this is where one of the reasons we're doing this, right, is because what we're talking about is already happening. You, you look at the whole self-development industry. People out there teaching you how to do your podcasts, how to do your websites, how to become graphic designers, regardless of what profession you're in. But what they mm -hmm. then have afterwards is this strong network. Now, healthcare is a massive industry, right? Healthcare professionals, there's so many of us, paramedics, pharmacists, doctors, you know, we're, we're, uh, you, know you, you can keep going. But what I do find is we're still in our groups, um, you know, that there's a lack of... Uh, networking between the professions and most importantly uh, as i said with you look at the self development industry it's a billion dollar industry yeah. but the reason why it works so well and people ask well, why do people go to these workshops you know why would someone go pay 1500 pounds to learn how to do a podcast everything's free on youtube it's not just the knowledge itself it's having that um, kind of relationship with other people who are there so you'd feel you're not alone I think you've touched upon it you know very uh, strongly there that you know it's not just you know you've heard about courses and, and the content may be great but when you come out of there what's next mm -hmm. like in that minute you're feeling great yeah and then you know how, how do I put it in practice I think that generally has been missing from healthcare professionals you know it doesn't matter which profession you're from mm -hmm. Yeah, agreed. I think especially with sort of pharmacy and in community pharmacy, sort of your own silos and the stresses and all the changes that are happening and which are coming, it's very easy just to get bogged down in that stress and not grow yourself or utilize the skills you have. And it's just, a, it's just realizing, you know, you can grow, you can develop and it will take time and it's just a matter of staying disciplined. Darren, thank you so much. Um, you know, again, three things, three pieces of advice you would give to whether it's pharmacists, or anybody in the healthcare profession who's thinking about either changing career or just, you know, what's next for them, or even those students who are now currently coming in university and thinking, you know, what's my future? What are the three things you would say to them? I would honestly say just talk to as many people as you can, hear your, hear their stories. Everyone's got different experiences. Um, I'm five years qualified, well, 2015 I qualified, and I was in my silo and it's just about talking to people and networking around and hearing everyone's stories and you will learn that everyone is sort of like-minded like yourself and you can grow together second i would, I would, I would say what total said get uncomfortable um it's very easy as pharmacists particularly we like our niche corners we like to just crack on and stay with the same routine get uncomfortable and just get out there and third one stay disciplined think of a goal write the plan out and stick with it because there will be hurdles um, and there'll be questions in the way, but just persevere. Darren, thank you so thank much. You, that Darren. was powerful. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming on thank the stream. You. I'll catch you soon. Cheers, guys. Right. So uh, that was Darren. Uh, I, I really uh, enjoyed that. And uh, I think there was a lot of um, points in there that really strike home, uh, especially whether you're a pharmacist uh, or, or any of the other healthcare professionals. But we definitely do get kind of stuck in this silo as, as the word he used and and it's sometimes hard to get out of it and one of the best ways to do that is just go meet new people and talk to new people
uh, advice that we've had since you know your kids people will tell you but it, it often is the simple things just following the simple things um right so i'm going to bring on uh mr yusuf yusuf welcome uh to the live stream today on a linkedin live session with myself and fahim thank you for uh, joining us thank you we'll see thank you fahim so yusuf tell us a bit about yourself um and and then just just so we have the background of what you're doing and, and where you're looking to go of course um i've been a pharmacist since 2006 so around almost coming up to 15 years i've worked in predominantly primary and secondary care more focused in the hospital environment than anywhere else um i worked in the nhs for a long period of time and worked in hospitals local in community and at the same time i've done a lot of self development. I'm currently the chief pharmacist of an organisation called Care UK, which is the largest independent organisation in NHS England. We have around 170 different service lines, varying from hospitals through to prisons, through to 111 centres, through to residential care homes. So a large conglomerate of different pharmacy services within that and pharmacists and pharmacy technicians and pharmacy professionals throughout that over a hundred different professionals. Um, I think my journey has been probably a, a journey where I've, I've just taken lots of opportunities. I've said yes a lot of the time and I think that has enabled me to have a very varied and portfolio um, working lifestyle but also career. Uh, but equally, I've seen pharmacy from the front line. I've seen pharmacy from middle management, and now I see pharmacy from a strategic and executive perspective. Uh, and having insight at all these different levels, you're able to see actually, pharmacy is a wonderful profession to be in. We we don't shout loud enough about that, and I think this is where we, as a profession, are lacking because we, we we've yet to really harness the power that pharmacy as a profession has. Other people can see it, but we don't. And uh, I think throughout my whole career, I've, that has cemented more and more as I've, I've, as I've gained more seniority. I've been in my current post for around four years. So that tells you that age is not a determinant to competence, but equally, Competence isn't determined by experience. Who says you can't be a, a leader at the age of 30, 31? Who says you need to be 40, 41? It's about what you are, what you stand for, and what you want to achieve for others rather than what you want to achieve for yourself. And which is very interesting. The, I've been hearing everyone, Tohido, Jane, they've all said similar things, is that there's so much opportunity there. There's so much uh, scope to do things we become our own worst enemies i think there's lots of you know, would you agree if you look at the especially pharmacy right you qualify you do your pre-reg especially those in community pharmacy you walk in you put your responsible pharmacist log in and then you look at your you you, you know get the whole dispensary in order you you get the prescription you check it you get the delivery sorted you know and that's how generally the day goes and yes you do a multitude of other things but essentially we're in this pattern we're in this lifestyle which is very repetitive day in day out so you know in terms of taking risks and then of course pharmacy is a very highly regulated profession so you know you've got to be careful you don't do this and you don't do that do you think that has a, a part to play in terms of um you know, reducing creativity or taking those risks because the profession kind of makes us, well, you know, if you make a mistake, then you're going to get this will happen and that will happen and that kind of uh, yeah. stops you from really expanding out. Yeah, there's risks in any healthcare setting, be it a nurse, be it a medic, be it a paramedic, for example. Risks are there because we deal with the public, we deal with population, we deal with humans. That's never going to go away, whether you're a pharmacist in the community or a pharmacist in the hospital, whether your job is a very 95 job or your job is very rudimental, risks are never going to go away. What we don't do is we don't galvanise or take the opportunity that's there because of that risk. 
But what we don't realize is the risk remains, whether you do something different or not, the risk remains. And it's about taking an appropriate and measured step. You know, I've, you know, throughout my early years of my career, I, I look on every Saturday, every weekend, on top of my hospital job. I found community pharmacy wonderful. I found it wonderful. I enjoyed it. It was directly with the patients. And more importantly, you're able to have some time and have a conversation with them. And and I think the opportunities or the or the limitations of the opportunity is not about the sector, it's about the individual. So who says pharmacy stops at 5 p.m. when you leave? Who's, who says that you're only a pharmacist for a certain period of the week? Pharmacy is not necessarily a career, it's a lifestyle, I seem as you mentioned. It's a way of being similar to what medics and nurses be. They will always be a nurse, whether they're in the hospital practicing or they're at home. And it's about what we do at every point in our life to understand opportunity rather than just looking at opportunity from a work and professional point of view. What have you seen? Um, you know, you, you've, 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 uh, as you said, experience doesn't necessarily display confidence, uh, competence, but, uh, you know, the experience you have gained, how have you seen technology really change the role of, of the professions over the years? And I'm not just talking about putting a dispensing robot into your farms. It generally, yeah. you know, yeah. uh, we've seen what's done to the retail sector, but, but tell me what you think uh, has been the effect and what we should be thinking about going forward. Yeah. So I've, I've worked in hospitals and in, in community where there's been automation there. So rather than looking at, at it as a risk, I've seen it as an opportunity. There's been development of roles, for example. And there's also been a time where technology advances, such as clinical decision making, such as um, appropriate use of uh, SCR or looking at uh, avenues of where we can uh, use imaging and bloods to a different degree. Technology has helped us to become better pharmacists and be more involved. I remember carrying the BNF with me everywhere in hospital. Now I have it on my phone, you know, and I think to myself, you know, the doctor has it on their phone, but what do I do in terms of my USP as a pharmacist, I'm able to interpret the BNF for the patient in front of me. And that's what we need to realize is that technology is advancing far quicker than we are as individuals. And you need to think about if you are a walking and talking BNF, how do you differ from the app that I have on my phone? If you can't understand things beyond uh, the paper, you're, you're not gonna go anywhere. So there's a risk for us that we're not gonna evolve be it tech related to clinical aspects, tech related to operational roles. If we don't develop and, and harness our skills better, we are going to be, become obsolete and that's due to our fault. So there's risks there, but I also think there's opportunities for us to do things differently, become more independent practitioners, be at the forefront of clinical care, pharmaceutical care. And I think there hasn't been enough conversation around that because most of the people that are doing the development in technology are non-pharmacy professionals. We have entrepreneurs, we have tech coders, tech specialists, we have investors. There's not many pharmacists leading in this field. And this is this is a shame. I think uh, something you mentioned, pharmaceutical sector, um, we know drug discovery and drug design is going to be greatly impacted by artificial intelligence, um, you know, potentially looking at reduced times to find new drugs. And that's, again, you know, traditionally pharmacy was community, hospital or industry. Uh, and industry was generally very hard to get into. However, I do feel now uh, the skill sets pharmacists <clears throat> bring and generally healthcare professionals now, you know, especially if you're growing up in this age where you're media savvy, you're tech savvy, you know, you, you're, you're, you're doing your streams, you're doing your social media posts. So there's definitely going to be an increased um, proportion of, of jobs and opportunities and available, especially in the pharmaceutical sector where, you know, uh, now because of the advent of technology and AI, um, we definitely have a even stronger role to play uh, yeah. going forward. So, so you don't just have to think that I'm I'm just in this box. Yeah, I, I sit on a board in a technology company, so I see it firsthand that pharmacists are have more strengths to the board than they ex expect, and technology companies can see it. 
pharmacists not only know about the patient, but also know about the intricacies of medicine, but also can relate to how um, populations should be cared for. And, you know, I've always said to my uh, colleagues and peers that pharmacy is a passport degree. It's a passport degree. It can take you anywhere you want to go. It's the, you're limited about what you think you, where you can go. So I've worked with pharmacists in the tech space. I've worked with pharmacists in the regulatory space. I've worked with pharmacists that are looking at AI. I've, look, I've seen pharmacists in big companies such as Google and Amazon. There is a lot of scope there, but you need to, and what I say to my colleagues is, what do you bring to the table? Rather than looking at what these companies offer, you need to have a core set of skill. You need to have insight. You need to have learning. You need to have development that you bring to the table so big, tech companies, pharma companies can actually say, yeah, this is what we need. Yusuf, thank you so much for that. Um, and, and to touch it off, uh, again, same question, really three things yeah. that you would advise uh, any young person uh, in any healthcare profession coming out, uh, you know, what, what is the advice you would give them considering, uh, you know, there are going to be fundamental changes in whatever profession you're in due to the advent of technology, due to the current health needs. Uh, of course, there's going to be climate change. You know, there's got a lot of things that are going to have big impact in our lives and so quickly as well. Like, you yeah. know, you know, the last 20 years uh, happened and the last 10 years go so fast. But yeah. Some of the things that are going to happen in the next 10 to 15 years are, you know, are going to be very significant. So it's so just three things you would advise. Sure. Them. You probably find, well, first one, let's start with your why. Why are you doing what you're doing, find your why, find your rationale, both in from a personal but also professional aspect. Number two, continued lifelong learning. There never should be a day where you're not learning. And if you if there is, you are doing something wrong. And one of the things why I say learning is key is that most jobs now, especially in some of the advancing roles, might not be there in 10 years time or 20 years time. So within your career, there's going to be a point where your job may not be there. So what learning, how you're doing to improve yourself. And the third thing I would say is help another person. One of the things that we don't do as a profession is bring other people along with us or help someone else in another capacity. So I would say to the third thing is either find a mentee or a mentor, find someone you can help with, or just take that time to help develop someone else. Because I think those sort of selfless, altruistic attitudes we need to promote more of. And I think doing that can not only help you gain financially more uh, income, but also at the same time, make you more fulfilled in your own. Yusuf, thank you so much for that. Thank yeah. you for another stream. And I'm sure we'll touch base and uh, have another discussion going forward. Thank you, Asim. Thank you, Fine. Yusuf, thank you. You know, it's, it's so far been an absolute wonderful evening. Uh, you know, with all the the speakers have just been just been fantastic. And they've all mentioned something that I've been you know, been, been getting across is you need to focus on what you what you want to do. That's the reality. And you know, Vaseem, I'd like to, you know, kind of bring you into the frame and 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 kind of ask you, you know, what advice would you give pharmacists in terms of, you know, in terms of the future, in terms of tech? You know, you're a you're a big believer of digitalization, and I had a conversation with one of my colleagues yesterday, uh, Muhammad, and he was saying something very similar that tech is on its way, and we need to be very much aware of it. You know, what are your what are your thoughts on this? So, I you know what two two years ago, uh, our other brother who's not on this stream uh, advised me go learn how to do a podcast. And at the time, I was thinking, okay, well, you know, I was like, probably got so much work to do in the pharmacy. Anyway went to the podcast and I met all these different people from different backgrounds and professions. Uh, and then, yes, we set up our own podcast. It's called Connect, Inspire, Grow. Um, and then, you know, that's kind of how my journey into media started. And from that, it led to a whole wide range of opportunities. We networked, we met new people. Some things went great. Other things didn't work as great. Uh, and we learned a lot. That's the most important thing. I think um, with the way technology is now, uh, as something Yusuf said, the jobs of today aren't necessarily going to be there tomorrow, number one. So what does that mean? Um, and, and I'm just going to point it to this way. Like you look at last 20 years or 30 years, uh, when you went to your local supermarket, how many people were working there? I really think about that. How many people would you go in and say hello to? 
And now you go to that same supermarket if it's still there. Uh, that's the other thing. Um, and if it's still there, how many people are left? There's not many. Uh, job roles are changing. And, uh, you know, when we talk about helping other people and just growing, what, what I will say is um, learning is essential. Uh, and, and this application is as important. You can learn as much as you want, but if you're not applying it, it, it it's, it's not going to have the effects that you need it to. And I'm going to give you my own example. Like I said, uh, started with a podcast. Uh, you know, we ended up working with celebrities. We, uh, you know, there was so many things that we did. As I said, some things went great, some things didn't. Um, ended up me doing a TED Talk uh, last year in October. Yeah. Uh, and, and again, <coughs> All this was because we decided to go out the box. Today, Fahim uh, is sitting here, and I remember we discussed setting up a training program seven and a half, eight years ago. But it took someone to take that step outside of his box, and and that was Fahim. So last two, you know, year and a half, two years, he spent working literally day and night in developing uh, Medlen. Um, and it was a risk as well, uh, because in the end of the day, he did his prescribing. I remember when he did his prescribing, me and my brothers and my father were like, well, we've invested in you. <laughs> Where's the financial return? Um, and, you know, there will be barriers. There'll be a lot of negativity that mostly will come from your own head, actually, uh, which will tell you this is not going to go. That's not going to work. So going forward and just look at all the conversations we've had today, you know, what everybody said from all the speakers um, you know, first of all, look at that little voice in your head. Don't be afraid to fail because uh, you will. Uh, and most importantly, when things go wrong, accept they've gone wrong. It won't happen straight away. There'll be times where you'll avoid it. Uh, but when they, you know, when you have come to that acceptance, don't just kill yourself over it. Don't just sit there and think, oh, I have set this person, you know, this didn't go right or that didn't go right. It didn't. And yes, you know, uh, maybe you could have handled it better. But in the end of the day, don't stop. Because when you are on that final stage of your life and you look back, no one else's opinion is going to matter at that point, just yours. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think, you know, you we've had yourself, we've had the other speakers. You know, ultimately, it's really important to make sure that you upskill yourself, you educate yourself, and you help where you can. And also, you know, make a difference in the life of others. If that's what you're doing, you can't go wrong. Okay. Great to have you. Thank as you. As a host here, it's been brilliant. Guys, thank you so much for joining our LinkedIn live session. Uh, again, thank you for all the speakers. I did not feel we had enough time to speak to them, and uh, we'll probably have to arrange follow ups. But uh, all of you are watching, you know, it's been an hour long, and I think uh, that takes anybody <coughs> attention span. For, so, those of you who kind of stuck it out, thank you. And those of you who joined in and, and you know, interacted and got to say, I hope this has given you uh, examples and, and, you know, just giving you uh, motivation and most importantly, real life examples of what you could be doing with your profession. So uh, thank you so much and uh, have a lovely evening. Thank you. Thank you. Good night.